In this unit, we're going to review some basic algebra and statistical methods that may have gotten a bit stale since high school, but are critical going forward in finance. The topics we'll cover are listed on this slide and are taken from Algebra 1 and Stat 1. Exponents, percent change, order of operations, solving equations for one variable, weighted average, word problems, probability distribution, expected return, and standard deviation. So let's get started. First topic, exponents. Let's review a bit and then we'll look at some examples. Basic, any value raised to a zero power is equal to one. A value raised to a negative power is the same as one over the value raised to that power. A value raised to a fractional power, such as one over n, is the same as taking the nth root of the value. A value raised to a fractional power m over n, where the numerator of the fraction is not 1, can be found as the nth root of the value quantity raised to the mth power. In this first example, 1 over 1.05 raised to the third power is the same as 1.05 raised to the minus third power. A value raised to a fraction involves a root, so x raised to the one-third power is equal to the cube root of x x raised to the two-thirds power is the cube root of x squared. Percent change is a basic concept in finance that will come up in several situations. The basic rule is new minus old, quantity divided by old. For example, if a stock was selling for $30 and the price declines to $26, the percent change in price is 26 minus 30 divided by 30, or a minus 13.33%. Taking the absolute value of a number always results in a positive value. The absolute value of a positive or negative value is positive. The absolute value of the difference between two values is indifferent to the direction of the subtraction. Solving equations for one variable is another high school algebra concept that doesn't get a lot of play in real life, but it does in finance. This slide lists the steps involved in finding a solution. First, substitute all given data into the equation. Eliminate any fractions. Isolate the variable of interest, meaning get it on one side of the equal sign and everything else on the other side. Simplify. And finally, if the variable of interest has a coefficient, divide through by that value. In this video, we're going to review something y'all probably learned about in eighth grade, order of operations. Not something that comes into play in everyday life, but it's going to be important in this class because we're going to do a lot of calculations. Applying order of operations correctly can mean the difference between getting the right answer and not. So there's the order, P-E-M-D-A-S. Working left to right, the first thing we do is deal with what's inside the parentheses. Next, handle any exponents, then multiply or divide, and finally add or subtract. It's a hierarchy. Parentheses are the highest order operation. You always do what's inside the parens first. We're going to look at three examples of solving some equations to illustrate how order of operations is applied. The first step is to isolate the variable of interest. If you're solving for x, that means get x on one side of the equal sign and everything else on the other side. Simplify in every way you can. And finally, if x has a coefficient, Divide through by that number so you have your answer. Let's look at our first example. It's a pretty easy one. First thing we need to do is deal with what's inside the parens. So that's going to give us 3 plus 2 times 3. Next, we're going to multiply 3 plus 6 and finally add, and there's our answer, 9. Now that was a pretty easy one. Let's look at one that's a little bit more involved. y is equal to x times 1 plus r, quantity raised to the n power. In this case, we're given y, x, and n. We're solving for r. The first thing we want to do is substitute what we've got. So we're going to have 4.84 is equal to 4 times 1 plus r squared. Clearly, we can't deal with what's inside the parens because that's where r is. Same reason we can't deal with the exponent. What we can do is divide both sides by 4. Gets rid of that and gives us 1.21 is equal to 1 plus r squared. Take the square root of both sides 
and we get 1.10 is equal to 1 plus r. r is equal to 0 0.10. Not too bad. Let's try our third one. In this case, our variable of interest x is in the numerator, and it involves an exponent. So the first thing we're going to do is multiply both sides by 3. That's going to get rid of the fraction on the left and leave us with 12 plus x squared is equal to 21. Subtract 12 from both sides, and we get x squared is equal to 9. Take square root of both sides, x is equal to 3. I hope this video has helped you recall order of operations. I want to emphasize how important it is to work things in that order when you're working a problem either manually or in Excel. If you're in doubt, put in parens to force the order since parens always come first. Weighted average is a concept that will appear repeatedly in finance, so let's review it. We're going to be using weighted average quite a bit in this course, so let's review how it works. The equation presented here is your standard weighted average equation. The sigma is the summation sign. It means the same thing as it does in Excel. Sum up what's to the right of it. The i running from 1 to n, that's telling you how many values you have to sum, n values. Wi is the weight of value i. Now, weight can also be a probability. In either case, the sum of the weights has got to be 100% or 1. x sub i is the value of i. Let's look at a very common example. Grade calculation. This is the grading scheme for 611. There's your grades. There's the weight of each of the grades. Remember your order of operations. Multiply across, add down, and there's your average. Simple enough, you've probably all done it to figure out your grade in a class. That's straightforward. The question often comes up, what do I need to make on the final to get an A? Here are the steps. Multiply across for all your known values, all the grades that you've got, and add that up. In this case, the sum without the final exam grade is 62.5. For an A, you need a 90. The final is worth 25%. So 90 minus 62.5 divided by that 25% says you need 110 on the final to make an A. Well, that's not going to happen. So how about a B? For a B, you need 80. So 80 minus 62.5 divided by 25% tells you a 70. You need a 70 to make a B. This can be solved manually fairly easily. You substitute in to the expanded equation all the known values. Simplify, isolate x, divide through by the coefficient of x, and you come up with the same answer we did. x is equal to 70. As proof of that, Plug the 70 in to our table, and sure enough, you come up with an average of 80. We're going to be using weighted average in both the straightforward manner to solve for the weighted average, as well as to solve for a missing value, as we did here for the needed final grade. This video is also posted separately with the lesson, so you can go back and review it if you need to. Most of us were introduced to word problems in about the third grade, and they were a challenge for just about everybody. The tricky part is picking out what data is needed and putting it to use, and these steps will help with word problems. First step, isolate and label all numeric data given in the problem. Be wary. Sometimes problems include variables that are not needed to solve the problem. They're red herrings. Identify what you're trying to solve for. What formulas do you need? Are you missing any needed variables? Will the given data allow you to find those missing variables? And finally, do not forget order of operations. Here's an example of a very simple word problem. A class of 25 students took a science test. 10 students had an arithmetic average score of 80. The other students had an average score of 60. What's the average score of the whole class? Breaking the problem down. It's a weighted average problem. N is 2 since there are two groups of students, those that averaged 80 and those that averaged 60. W sub 1 is the weight or percentage that averaged 80. It's 10 divided by 25 or 40 percent. X sub 1 is 80, the value that goes with weight 1. Weight 2 is the rest of the class, 60 percent or 15 over 25. And X sub 2 is 60, the value that goes with weight 2. 
applying the weighted average formula, the class average is 68. A probability distribution describes a number of states, the probability of each state occurring, and the expected outcome in each state. For our example, I'm using a probability distribution that describes five states of the economy and the expected return on an investment in each state. A probability distribution is, in some ways, a variation on a weighted average, except in this case the weights are probabilities. The same rule applies. The probabilities must add up to 1 or 100 percent. The same method applies as well. Multiply each expected return times its associated probability. Add up the results. In this video, I want to walk us through expected return and standard deviation, looking at all the steps and working it in Excel. On this screen, you're seeing the data you would be given states of the economy, the probability of those states occurring, and the expected return on the asset or investment in those states. And these are the two equations that we need, expected return and standard deviation. Actually, we calculate variance since standard deviation is the square root of variance. Note, these equations are for expectational data. The data are presented as a probability distribution. If this were a sample of historical data, we would use slightly different equations which take into account using average return rather than expected return in the standard deviation equation. An important thing to remember, especially with standard deviation, order of operations, P-E-M-D-A-S. First, we look at parentheses, what's inside the parens. Then we handle exponents, then multiply, divide, and finally add and subtract. We're going to work through this example. First step you have to calculate the expected return. First thing we do is the multiply divide. There are no parens, no exponents. We're going to multiply across probability 0.15 times the expected return in that state, minus 12.50 equals minus 1.88. Repeat that for all states of the economy. That takes care of the multiply part of the equation. Second step, add those values we just calculated. That's the summation sign, where n is the number of states of the economy, and there's our expected return, 2.75. Now we're going to start on standard deviation, and this is where order of operations is really important. First thing we need to do is calculate the deviation. Look at the formula. We need what's inside the parens. The expected return in each state of the economy minus the overall expected return that we found in step two. The values we calculated in step one are grayed out now since we don't need them anymore. The first value is going to be minus 1250 minus 275, then minus 8.5 minus 275 all the way down. The next step is to square those numbers. Negative 1525 squared is a positive number. Remember, when you square a number, the result is positive. We're handling the exponent, the next item in order of operations, so we square each one of the deviations. In step five, we multiply the squared deviation by the probability. Step six, the summation sign. We add up that column. That result is the variance. We want the standard deviation, so in the seventh step, we take the square root of the variance and we get 9.86 as our standard deviation. Now that's showing you all the numbers. Let's work our way through the calculations using Excel. You would follow the same step solving for standard deviation in your calculator. So the first thing we're going to do is multiply across and copy it down. Place your cursor on the right corner and drag it down. To add them up, use AutoSum, the summation sign. Place your cursor in E11 and click on AutoSum. It will default to the range of cells directly above the cell your cursor is on. And in this case, that's what we want. So hit return. There's our expected return of 2.75. Now I'm over here in the standard deviation. The first one is the minus 1250 minus our expected return from step two, the 275. And I want to freeze that. Copy that down. To square these in Excel, use the caret. And copy that down. Finally, we're going to multiply these times the probability. and copy that down. Sum these up using auto sum again. We have our variance. To get standard deviation, use the square root function. And we have our square root, 
Following the order of operations hierarchy, especially in the standard deviation equation, is critical to finding the correct result. We've worked our way through expected return and standard deviation step by step, and we've gone through an example. An important thing to remember, if you're asked to solve for standard deviation, you're probably going to be presented with data that looks like this. Probability, states of the economy, and expected return in each state. The first thing you have to do is solve for expected return, since you need that to solve for variance and standard deviation. And when solving for standard deviation, I cannot emphasize enough how important order of operations is. If you start inside the parens, then handle the exponent, then multiply, divide, finally add, subtract, and last step, take the square root, you'll get the correct answer. Take the time to watch this video for a step-by-step -step walkthrough of finding the expected return and standard deviation given a probability distribution. This ends our brief review of some algebra and statistical methods needed in finance. The videos in this lesson are posted separately for viewing outside the lesson.